you open your Bibles with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30. <clears throat> I've titled this message, Things Too Wonderful. Everything about God is unsearchable beyond our ability to understand or to comprehend, and uh, they're too wonderful. They're just too wonderful. But they are believed. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the scriptures are very clear, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I'm so thankful that the Lord doesn't require us to understand these things. Truth is, truth is, we don't understand anything we believe. Not really. And these pseudo-intellectual theologian types that would make us think that you have to have a certain degree of of understanding of theology and doctrine and the things of the Bible before you can be saved are putting a stumbling block before men because scripture calls on us to believe to believe look what uh, look what the psalmist Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 30 at verse 18. <clears throat> there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And then in the next verse, he gives us four things that are of the physical world. To illustrate the spiritual things that are too wonderful for us. When, this, when Solomon says, turn, turn with me over just a few pages back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 5. The wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Now go back with me to our text. If we, if we say there are four things that are too wonderful for me and all we think of is the way of the eagle in the air and the way of a serpent upon a rock and the way of a ship in the midst of the sea and the way of a man with a maid, then we might think, well, we have some scientific knowledge now of those things that the ancients didn't have. And so these things are no longer too wonderful for us. But these are proverbs. The Lord's not talking about a physical serpent crawling on a rock. The Lord's not talking about a physical ship in the sea. He's, he's not talking about a physical bird flying in the air. And he's not talking about the conception of a child between a man and a woman. He's talking about things that are far, far too wonderful for us 
And yet, things that faith believes. I want us to believe God this morning. Just to believe him. <laughs> this is... Uh, <clears throat> Faith is what's required for salvation, to believe God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the, with the tongue confession is made unto salvation. It's not, it's not a, a matter of feeling something. Some people are waiting for a feeling. Don't wait for a feeling. Feelings are at best subjective and unreliable. Faith is hanging all the hopes of your immortal soul on the truth of what God has declared. <laughs> Saying, these things are too wonderful for me, yet I believe them. I believe them. They're beyond my understanding. They're beyond my experience. They're beyond anything that I can, that I can comprehend. And yet, God has given me faith to believe, to believe. See, we're not saved by knowledge. We're not saved by an experience or a feeling. Uh, we're not certainly saved by works. <laughs> it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Oh, no. No, we're saved by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We're, finished. we're saved by him. <laughs> by his work of redemption. We're saved by him as our, as our sin bearer and as our substitute, as our surety standing in our stead before a holy God and, 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 and pleading his righteousness on our behalf. That's, he's the one who does the saving, not, not by anything that we do. We're saved through faith. Faith is not something that we can pretend to understand or pretend to experience. We've, we've not yet felt the fullness of our sorrow as we ought. We've not yet rejoiced in the rejoicing that we ought to rejoice in. We've not yet worshipped as we ought to worship. <laughs> but the Lord Jesus Christ did. And... Uh, and we come into the presence of God with an eye of faith toward him. And we trust that what he did is sufficient. We're certainly not saved by our birthright, young people. You know, Michael, you brought out a point in the scripture reading about those of us who spent years in religion being self-righteous and trusting in our own works of righteousness, trying to establish our own righteousness. I wanna to say to our young people who have not experienced religion like some of us have, uh, you, you've spent all your life sitting under the gospel. That's all you've ever heard. You know that, that, that the righteousness of Christ is the only acceptance that you had before God. That's all you've ever heard. You've never heard anything else. You've not had a man stand in a pulpit and speak on behalf of God and tell you that there were things you had to do in order to earn favor with God. You know that's a lie. And yet you are just as self-righteous by nature as we were. That's the nature of man. You, you, it's self-righteousness. <laughs> it's, the, it's the root. You see, it's not our sin that keeps us from God. It's our righteousness that keeps us from God. <clears throat> if you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the problem is your righteousness. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, it's not, a, it's not a problem that's peculiar to those who were caught up in in self-righteous free will religion it's a problem of all men we're born into this world self-righteous until the lord strips you naked before him and causes you to see that you're a sinner and that you have no righteousness and that your only hope before god 
is that the Lord Jesus Christ would be all of your righteousness, then that's what keeps man from Christ. Men from Christ, it's their righteousness. And so birthright doesn't get us into heaven. <laughs> what, did those, what did those Pharisees say? We be children of Abraham. You know, we're, we, we can trace our, our bloodline back through all, the, through all of our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers all the way back to Abraham and, and the tribes of Jacob and, and, and what did the Lord say? From these stones, God can raise up children to Abraham. And you know that's exactly what he does. He takes these who, those who have hearts of stone, dead, cold, lifeless, unbelieving hearts, and he raises them up and he gives them a heart of flesh. And he makes children of Abraham from the stones of this earth. So birthright doesn't, doesn't get you into heaven. Birthright doesn't make you right with God any more than works or, or, or feelings or experience or knowledge. Those are not you know, faith. It's believing God. And what we believe is too wonderful for us. It's just too wonderful. But we believe it because God has given us faith to believe him. We don't say, well, yeah, I believe that, but that's what the... That's what the religious do, don't they? They'll say, well, yeah, I believe what you're saying, but what about this and what about that? No, we just, Lord, I believe. Oh, help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> and we're not saved by tradition. Turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 8. Beware, the Bible's full of warnings because the Lord knows that we are foolish and slow of heart to believe. And that if he doesn't warn us, he will get caught up in something we ought not to be involved in. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Oh, the world is full of philosophers, isn't it? Oh, the Stoics and the Epicureans, oh, they think they've got their answers. They think they've got, you know what the word philosophy means. It means this love of knowledge. And man prides himself. Knowledge puffeth up. What we believe is too wonderful for us. We don't pretend to understand it. We believe it. But don't let, don't let someone spoil you of your hope with vain philosophy. Look. Through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. There's our hope. <clears throat> our completeness before God is found in Christ. We're just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be our advocate, to be our savior, to be our substitute. Do we understand these things about him? Oh, what do we understand about God? How can we? But we believe. Go back with me to our text. <clears throat> And, and salvation is not because of a decision that we make. The Lord said, you did not choose me. <laughs> you didn't choose me. I chose you. <laughs> I chose you. It is not of him that willeth. You can't. We saw what man's will does in the first hour. What did Thomas say? I will not believe. Oh, yeah, you will, Thomas. <laughs> I'm going to make myself irresistible to you when you're going to bow and you're going to confess that I'm Lord and that I'm God. Did Thomas, when Thomas saw the Lord Jesus, did he say, oh, I see now, I understand. Okay, I got it. No, no, he bowed before his feet and he said, my Lord and my God, 
I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand how this could be. I know you were crucified. I know you were put into a grave. I know you were dead. And here you are standing before me alive. All I can do is confess that you are Lord and you are God. That's all I can do. And that's what faith does. We don't pretend to understand. So what is the Lord telling us here? In these, in these things that are too wonderful for us. Well, what does the Bible say about the eagle in the air? Look at, look at we're back to our text now in, in Proverbs chapter 30. <clears throat> that was all introduction, but I'm going to go through these four points very quickly. Okay? The way of the eagle in the air. What does the Lord say about the eagle in the air. Well, turn over with me to Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. <laughs> what, is it that the, what is it that Solomon's saying? These things are too wonderful for me. The way of the eagle in the air. He's not just looking at an eagle being caught up in the in the thermals and in the and the wind currents and the and the innate ability that this magnificent bird has to fly in the air. He's talking about faith. How is it that I could mount up with wings as an eagle? How is it that God could give me faith? Of all the billions of people in this world that have never even heard the gospel and all the millions of people that have heard and not believed, Lord, why me? Why would you cause me to believe you? To have faith in Christ? Lord, it's beyond my comprehension. It's too wonderful for me. I can't conclude that I just decided one day that I would believe. How the Lord in his providence brought me under the sound of the gospel. And how the Lord in his mercy and his grace gave me ears to hear. And eyes to see and hearts to believe. How the wind of the spirit that he spoke to Nicodemus would had to blow whithersoever he listeth. Blew my way and caused me to believe on Christ. This is too wonderful for me. I can't explain it. It's a work of God. Is your faith too wonderful for you? Is it just beyond your, your ability to, 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 to see how it is that you would have faith? <laughs> Turn to me to Revelation chapter 12. The church is spoken of as a woman in Revelation 12. And in verse 1 it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of twelve storms, stars, stars. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, in, in prophetic symbolic language being illustrated as a woman. And... And look at, look at verse, look at verse six. When the, when the devil got after this woman, the scripture says in verse six, and the woman fled into the wilderness. That's where you and I live. We walk by faith in a dry and thirsty land. We live in Babylon. We live in the wilderness where there is no bread, where there's a famine in the land. And God feeds us 
with the bread of life. He gives us this bread from heaven. This is the eagle in the air. I'll show you that. Look at, look at, um, look at verse um, The woman fled into the wilderness, verse 6, where she hath the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, a thousand three hundred and two score days is the, is the prophetic symbol of the period of time between the first and second coming of Christ. So that's where we are. That's where we are. God's going to feed her in the wilderness. He's prepared a place for her. You see, we've come to feast right now. This is the place that the Lord has prepared for us to, to, to eat the body of Christ and to drink the blood of Christ. And look at verse, look at verse uh, 14. And to the woman, and to the woman, the church, the believer, were given two great wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time in the face of the serpent. <laughs> now, what are these two great wings that the Lord has given to this woman? The word of God and the spirit of God. These things are repeated over and over again. These are the two witnesses that lay dead in the streets of Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. This is the two olive trees that dump their oil into the lamp. <laughs> the word of God and the spirit of God. And here's the thing that's too wonderful for me. The way of the eagle in the air. How is it that I hear the word of God? How is it that I'm comforted by the spirit of God? How is it that I'm given faith to believe God when the whole unbelieving world is on their way to hell? This is too wonderful for me. That's the way of the eagle, of the eagle in the air. Turn with me back to the book of Job, just before the Psalms, Job chapter 39. Now, the Lord is, <laughs> is interrogating self-righteous Job. <laughs> Job's been saying, this isn't fair, this isn't right, let me bring my case before you and I'll prove to you that I'm not guilty and I'm not worthy of this, this trial that you're giving to me. And God sends a preacher by the name of Elihu, and Elihu preaches the gospel to Job, and Job's mouth is shut. And he says, I, I see something I've never seen before. I'm vile. I had heard of thee by the hearing of mine ears, but now mine eyes have seen thee, and I repent in dust and ashes. Oh, Lord, surely I spoke without knowledge. I didn't know what I was talking about. And here's one of the questions that the Lord asked Job in Job chapter 39 at verse, at verse 27. Job, doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? Job, are you going to convince somebody to believe God? <laughs> are you going to convert your neighbor? and make them to be a Christian? <laughs> Are you gonna give them the two great wings of the eagle and enable them to, to, to fly into that place that's been prepared for them in the wilderness? Are you gonna be able to do that? Can you do it for yourself? <laughs> no, no, this is too wonderful for me. Verse 28, she dwelleth and abideth on the rock upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. Again, he's not talking about that bird. <laughs> you gonna make yourself a firm footing on the rock? You gonna give yourself hope in Christ? You gonna help somebody else? You gonna, you gonna convert somebody else? No, this is too wonderful for me. This is the work of God. All we can do is declare the truth of what God says. Faith, yes, comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. But faith is a miracle of grace in the heart. You can't give it to yourself. I can't give it to you. God has to make us soar with wings of eagles. But 
Look at verse 29. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. <laughs> they say eagles have, well, we, we talk about the eagle eye, and oh, they've got a tremendous eyesight. They can spot a prey from tens of thousands of feet in the air and come down. And that's what the Lord gives us eyes to see. Oh, we'll, we'll cross whatever barrier we have to cross in order to get to that one that he's enabled us to set our affections on. And look at the next verse, verse 30. Her young ones also suck up blood. And where the slain are, there she is. Lest you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you shall have no life in you. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table this morning. Our young ones, that's our hope for our children. It's the Lord will give them the grace to have faith in Christ. To drink of his blood, to eat of his flesh, to have life. What does, a, what does Solomon say? The way of the eagle in the air. Oh, it's just too wonderful for me. I believe it. Can I explain it? <laughs> can, I, can I in any way understand it? No. No. What is the second thing that, the, that Solomon says are too wonderful for me? Go back with me to our text in Proverbs chapter 30. <coughs> At verse 19, the way of the eagle in the air, that's faith, brethren. And uh, the way of the serpent upon the rock. I actually saw a video recently of a snake trying to crawl on a flat rock, and it couldn't, it couldn't move. I mean, it couldn't, it didn't, it didn't have anything to do. That's not what he's talking about. No way he's talking about. <laughs> what is the serpent a picture of? Satan. Who is the father of lies and the, the originator of all sin? And, and who's the rock? Who's the rock? Who's the rock? The, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the rock. He's the foundation stone. He's the stone which the builders have rejected that God has made the head of the corner. He's the rock. Upon this rock I will build my church. What rock? That you are the Christ the son of the living God. He's the rock. So what is a serpent upon the rock? Well, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God has made him sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Can you enter into that? Can you understand how the, how the holy, harmless, separate from sinner, son of God, creator and sustainer of all of the universe, the one that the seraphims hovered over his throne and cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Can you understand how he could be made sin? That's the serpent upon the rock. You remember what happened in the wilderness? When uh, the children of Israel, they said, we loathe this light bread. That's what they said. We're sick and tired of eating manna every day. We're eating manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. And it was nothing appealing. If you had to eat the same thing every meal, you'd get tired of it, wouldn't you? Well, they did too. But that's not the picture here. You see, the flesh gets tired of the same thing. And we, we, don't do, we can't do anything forever. We've got to have a change of scenery. We've got to have vacation. We have a change of menu. We have a change of clothes. Why? Because our flesh can't just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. But not so with the Spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. Christ is sufficient. We never get tired of him. <laughs> we have him for breakfast, have him for lunch, have him for dinner. <laughs> Christ, who is our life, 
is that manna from heaven, always feasting on him and never tired of him. But the children of Israel said, we loathe this light bread. And that's what the world says, the religious world. They hear the gospel, oh no, Christ is not enough. I've got to do my part. We're not, we're not, we're not content with just Christ. And so they add to him. And this book concludes with this warning. If any man add to the words of the prophecy of this book, then the curses of this book will be added unto him. Don't add to the work of Christ. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents, venomous snakes into the camp. And there were snakes everywhere. People were getting bit by snakes and dying. And they came to Moses and they said, do something, get rid of these snakes. And Moses went to the Lord and the Lord said, make a brazen serpent, a brass serpent. Fashion a serpent out of brass and put it on a pole and hold it up above the people. And anyone who looks to that serpent will be healed. And the Lord Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up. And if any man come unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. The way of the serpent upon the rock is the imputation of our sin placed on the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung on Calvary's cross, satisfying the demands of God's holy wrath. He's that serpent on a pole. And God says, if you'll just look to him, look to him, faith in Christ. Can you understand what was happening on Calvary's cross? Can you comprehend the fact that, that God was being satisfied with the sacrifice that Christ was making for all the sins of all of God's people. Can you, can, you, can you even begin to imagine or to understand in any way how it is that, that God could bear every sin that you ever committed and every sin that every one of God's people ever, ever committed before God. And that the full fury of God's wrath was poured out at Christ. You see, the problem, there's a, there's a group of, of men that call themselves preachers who deny that Christ was made sin. And the reason they deny it is because they're trying to understand it intellectually. And they can't. Well, praise God, neither can I. But I'm not going to deny it. Because the scriptures are clear. Let me show you. Turn with me back to uh, Psalm 38. <clears throat> David is speaking again prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look what he says in verse 3 of Psalm 38. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities have gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Look at verse 11. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen stand afar off. They also, verse 12, that seek after my life lay snares for me that they may seek my hurt. They that seek my hurt speak mischievous things. And imagine deceit all the day long. Look at verse 17. For I am ready to halt. I'm ready to die. For my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare mine iniquity. And I will be sorry for my sin. And Solomon says. The way of the serpent upon the rock. is too wonderful for me. I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how God could be made sin. I don't understand what was happening between God the Son and God the Father as he was offering himself as an offering for sin and satisfying the demands of God's justice and righteousness. I don't understand that. But I believe it. 
It's the only hope I have. Oh, and what hope. <laughs> what hope to be able to say, these things are too wonderful for me. They're too wonderful for me. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's the scapegoat. God placed his hands on his head and, and led him into the wilderness. He's the one. You remember, you remember when Moses went to Pharaoh first and God told him, he said, tell Aaron to throw down the staff. And Aaron threw down the staff and it was turned into a serpent. And the magicians of Moses did the same thing and theirs were turned into serpents too. Slide of hand. You know, maybe they had hollow staffs with snakes on the inside of them. I don't know how they did it. But you know what happened? Aaron's serpent ate up. Oh, swallowed them. <laughs> swallowed every one of the magician's serpents. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He swallowed up sin. And all the all the lies of religion, all the sleight of hand, all the deceitfulness of man-made religion, the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished the salvation of his people. These things are too wonderful for us. Thirdly, the way of the ship in the midst of the sea. You know what the ship represents. It's the church. It's the church. Just like we have in the story of Jonah, where the mariners were caught in a sea and they thought they were all going to die and they had to find out who was the cause of the trouble that they were in. And, Mo and Jonah was identified and Jonah said, cast me into the sea. And as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Lord Jesus Christ spent those days in the belly of the earth and God brought him forth victorious. But as soon as Jonah hit the water, the seas became a placid lake. <laughs> the turbulence were, were done away. And the, and the sailors on that ship. You remember in Acts chapter 27, when Paul was being taken to Rome, he'd appealed unto Caesar and they're off the island of Melita, and there's a great storm. And Paul told the captain, he said, don't let anyone off this ship. We will all survive. If they get off, they won't survive. The ship ended up breaking into pieces. They, uh, some of the sailors tried to get off, and the captain stopped them. <laughs> and the scripture concludes in Acts chapter 27 at the last verse, it says, and they all made it to the land safely. Why? They're stuck with a ship. What a picture. This is, this is God's ship. Sometimes it's being the disciples on the city, on the, on the, uh, the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and they're caught up in the storm. And the, Lord's, and the Lord comes to them walking on the water. This is the ship. This is God's people. And the way, of the, the way of the Lord is through the sea. You see, if the way of the eagle in the air is faith, and the way of the snake upon the rock is substitution, then the way of the ship in the sea is sanctification. This is our life in this world. And we're being tossed sometimes to and fro by the, by, the, by the storms that God sends. And yet we have an anchor for our soul, a forerunner that has gone before us into the heavens, the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone on that ship are going to make it safely to the other side. How? How are we going to get there? How are we going to, how are we going to survive? what the Lord's doing and what he's going to do tomorrow and, <clears throat> and how he's working these things all together for good, I know not. I don't understand. They're too wonderful for me. But I know that he's doing it and that he's going to, he's going to get us all to glory. <laughs> and then 
the last one is the way of a man with a maid. He's talking about the union between a man and a woman and the conception of a child and the, and the, the growth of that child in the womb and the birth of that child. And, and, and we say, yeah, but we know so much more about that now than what they would have known then. That's not so, not so mysterious. <clears throat> you know, the more we learn about things, the more we understand we don't know. Every new discovery in science only opens up a thousand more questions that we didn't even know to ask before. It's just as miraculous and just as mysterious today as it ever has been before. But he's not talking about the physical birth of a child. He's talking about the new birth. Lord, how is it that you could take one who is at enmity with you and cause him to love you? How is it that you could take someone who's dead in their trespasses and sins and make them alive? How is it that you could take an unbeliever and make them a believer? How is it that you could take one who is lost and separated from God and a stranger from the covenants of grace without God in his life and without any hope and birth him, birth him with a new birth, except a man be born again, he shall not enter into the kingdom of God. How is it that you do that? Lord, could you be, could you be giving the new birth to someone right now? It would be, it would be beyond our understanding. It'd be, it'd be too wonderful for us. We would rejoice, and we do rejoice, when someone confesses Christ in baptism. But how that came about is too wonderful for me. Are these things too wonderful for you? They're too wonderful for you to understand them. They're too wonderful for you to experience them like they ought to be experienced. <laughs> and yet, you've hung all the hopes of your immortal soul on the truth of them. And God has made you to believe them. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Number seven. Let's stand together. The spiral hymnal, number seven.